Earlier this spring, we contracted with the Racial Equity Group to conduct a racial equity assessment to get a baseline metric of where the organization is and specifically gauging employees' thoughts and perspectives on our work around advancing racial equity. And so this assessment is a, actually a follow-on step to the racial equity mindset training that we, facilit we facilitated for county employees last summer. And Bird Guess, who is joining us, was the facilitator for that. And so while it may seem a little bit out of order to first do the training and then do an assessment, we had already been so far along on our journey and we really wanted to take the time after we'd done the training to understand where employees might be with the work that we were doing and set us up for looking forward to how we might move forward from that training and what other things we might be able to do or need to continue to advance the work. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Guess and Ms. Paulson to to share the report on the assessment along with some recommendations. Okay, uh, thank you, Samia, um, for that introduction. And I wanna just say um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with Arlington County and being able to share the results uh, of the racial equity audit assessment report. My colleague Renee is having, uh, having some uh, uh, issues with uh, flight, flight delays today, so she's not able to uh, attend, so I will continue uh, on her behalf uh, as well. So uh, again, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share this, this report as the county continues its journey for advancing racial equity for all stakeholders. Um, so what I'll do is um, kind of go briefly through the results uh, and be able to share uh, where we are now uh, on this journey as well. Um, so now I will go ahead and uh, move to our introduction page. So this is going to serve as our table of contents. This is what we call the audit assessment report roadmap. Uh, we're going to start off just with the introduction, and this is just really going to cover just some background information on what is the racial equity mindset framework, the approach, the methodology that we used, and why the county has really, um, what was the purpose of the county being able to do this, uh, to do, doing this work uh, on their existing work. Then we will look into the uh, executive summary, and this is where we will discuss some of the key findings of the respondents who participated in this survey, in this audit assessment, what were the demographics of those respondents, and what did, uh, how did the county um, uh, score based upon the commitment uh, to racial equity based on best practices. Then we will look at best practices, best practices and understand what the gap analysis are, what is the current reality, what is the baseline for the county in terms of racial equity commitment, and then compare that to best practices and reveal any gaps and where the county can uh, look forward to setting goals as well as uh, tracking its progress along the way. We will also end with some recommendations and next steps uh, of this report. Keep in mind, this is just a snapshot of a full uh, comprehensive report, uh, but just for the, to be able to maximize the time that we have here with the board, we're just going to uh, share highlights uh, from that report and, 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 all, and our overall recommendations and observations. So racial equity for Arlington County government is really defined as ensuring that all stakeholders are served equitably. Uh, all stakeholders are served equitably, as well as employees, employees uh, having equitable opportunity and employment, uh, procurement. So all of county's operations is their equitable opportunity um, for all stakeholders. Now, what we also wanted to do was that that sounds great um, as far as how we define that, but we want to really compare that and measure that on evidence-based best practices. And I always like to say that, you know, if you don't have data, then all you have is an opinion about what uh, the current racial equity or the equitable environment looks like for any municipality. So there's six competencies that we wanted to measure the county on, uh, six levels of commitment. Institutional commitment, this is just primarily looking to see, are there accountability structures uh, in place? Is there dedicated talent and resources for racial equity? We also wanted to look at leadership commitment. 
Uh, we wanted to see and measure uh, our department heads, uh, managers, supervisors, are they taking ownership of racial equity? And how do you know if people are taking ownership? Uh, are they setting goals? Uh, are they participating? Are they looking at data uh, all throughout their departments to make sure that they are advancing racial equity for the county as a whole, just like they would in any other uh, aspect of uh, business operations for the county? Capacity building is another level of commitment where we want to, we know that the county by itself as an institution cannot advance racial equity alone. Uh, it's going to take partnerships with community organizations, professional associations, uh, schools uh, uh, as well to be able to have a shared purpose for advancing racial equity. So we look to see how strong and how many partnerships uh, take place collaboratively with external stakeholders. Data and disparities. Uh, it's very hard to understand if you have inequities if you're not collecting the data, you're not tracking the data, measuring and monitoring the data to begin with by various demographic groups. Primarily for us, it's focusing on race, ethnicity, and then as well as belonging and inclusion and knowledge and competence. Uh, belonging and inclusion is just measuring the employees' uh, feelings of being valued. Uh, as well as um, being accepted and empowered within the organization. And then knowledge and competence. Do employees, are they aware of what biases are, what microaggressions are? Do they have the skill set to help the county advance racial equity in all of their respective uh, departments and business units? Once we are able to uh, develop questions, there's 34 questions that are tied to six competencies. And once those employees have uh, asked, uh, answered those questions to the best of their ability uh, on those uh, six, comp uh, six competencies, it's going to help us understand where the county falls on this continuum of racial equity commitment that you see here on a scale of one to five. Uh, it'll tell us whether the county is a colorblind institution, cautious institution, compliant or committed institution. And there are in the in the in the full report, you'll see uh, extensive definitions for each one of these. But just to give you an example, a lot of organizations that start this work fall off, fall into a level three of a compliant institution, meaning they're very reactive. There was some type of incident that occurred, uh, maybe some type of racial incident that occurred that an organization reacted by wanting to send everyone to um, sensitivity training or bias training committed institutions, they don't wait for incidents to occur. They proactively equip all of their staff in training on biases, uh, cultural competence, uh, as well as making sure that uh, they're aware of blind spots and decision making on policies and practices. Uh, again, they're very proactive. They use data to be able to measure their progress. Uh, so we're going to just we're going to look at the data and see uh, as a, and establish a baseline and a benchmark for the county uh, on this level of on this continuum uh, level of commitment. Now we'll move into our executive summary and key findings for some of the respondents. So between April uh, and May of uh, of this year, earlier this year, we invited uh, 4,500 employees to participate in the racial equity audit assessment. Of those, our participation rate was 42%. 1,891 employees reacted to the email invitation. And of that, our response rate is 81%. So of those 1,891, 1,523 employees actually start at the assessment. But it doesn't matter how many start the assessment. Uh, when we're looking at valid statistical data, we want to know how many of those responses were, were considered valid responses. And our number of valid responses was 1,265 employees. Um, that's almost uh, a third of the pop of the total employment population for the county, uh, which is a very solid uh, valid response rate. That's what we look for more than anything when we're doing this analysis. If you can get 25 percent uh, of employees to have uh, to validly respond to a survey, that is a solid benchmark to look at. The county got 33 percent, about 33, 34 um, percent. Now. <clears throat> 
when you talk about invalid response rates, uh, what, what makes a response invalid? Sometimes employees will start a survey, but they will they will partially complete it. They won't fully complete the survey. Some uh, some employees take go through a survey way too fast. We know the survey on average will take between 12 to 15 minutes, but some people just go through and check the box and they complete a survey less than two minutes. So we're going to invalidate uh, that response. And then some are just too slow. Uh, uh, they may start it, but left it open for extended period of time, two, two, three hours for them to take the survey. We know, again, it doesn't take that long, um, but they just may have forgotten to, to, to finish it or complete it. So there's there's different ways that we, uh, statistical methods that we use to uh, invalidate response so that we want to have the most accurate data as much as possible. So oh, we'll go back, go back to that slide for one moment. Yep. Uh, so when you think about the, who the, what the respondents look like, so of those 1,265 valid responses, so we can see here, uh, the, the, um, uh, about almost 50% of them were female. Um, so 48% female, you had 35% were male, and you had a large group, about 16%, uh, that identified as unknown or PNS stands for prefer not to say. And that's typical in every survey. We want to give people the option to not self-identify for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, that people want to have their confidentiality, their anonymity protected, uh, especially depending on where they work. If there's a small, if there's not a, a large, diverse group of people in a particular department, uh, people, again, want to protect themselves. Or if the culture, um, it could say a lot of things about the culture, but it's typical to see people not want to self-identify uh, their demographics uh, in, in surveys. For race and ethnicity, uh, we can see that um, we are kind of uh, diverse in terms of the respondents. We have about 36% of the respondents were white, 22.5% were black, uh, and about 18% uh, were unknown, prefer not to say. And then Hispanics, we had about 12.3%, Asians 5.6% as well. So uh, good diversity in the in the respondents uh, in terms of the racial, race, ethnicity of the respondents. When we look at sexual orientation, uh, we can see that 72.3% were uh, majority straight or heterosexual. And then the second largest component was unknown or preferred not to say. And then age, we can see that we had a wide variety of different age groups uh, who, uh, for their, for their, who selected for their uh, age demographic. Now, what was our actual uh, our, our level of racial equity commitment uh, aggregate overall commitment is what we'll call the score because it's an aggregate score. Uh, uh, Y1 stands for year one. The county is a, a benchmark of 3.88 for the aggregate score. Uh, now, keep in mind, we also, when you're doing racial equity work, you want to make sure that you disaggregate and break it out by, by demographic groups as much as possible uh, so it's more even more accurate. Uh, but when we look at just the overall uh, score of commitment uh, for year one is 3.88, which place, uh, positions the county at a level of compliant on the racial equity continuum uh, here of commitment. Let's dig a little bit deeper into what that score means, the aggregate results, and then we'll look at the disaggregated results. So as you can see, we have six competencies. You can see the score for each of those six competencies. And you can see uh, our strongest score is knowledge and competence. So what this really entails is employees understand why racial equity is important. Uh, they know what racial, equ racial equity looks like in their departments. They understand why the county should focus on racial equity. So uh, on that scale of one to five, we're at 4.16 um, employees. That's one of that's our strongest competency. Our greatest opportunity, as we can see, is data and disparities. Um, and it, it's really not a lot, lo not a very low score, uh, especially it just shows the amount of work that's already been done. The county has already built a very solid infrastructure prior to engaging with the racial equity group. Uh, and it shows in the scoring that we have here uh, that we see now. Uh, but data and disparities uh, is our greatest opportunity to keep building on the existing work uh, and infrastructure that we've already built and created. Uh, and we can see we're very strong in some other areas as well. Now, what we've done here, uh, this slide is, is, has a lot going on on this slide here, but what this slide will tell us is at the top, you have six columns, and those are the six competencies that we measure, race, measure racial equity on. And then below each of the, uh, the six competencies, they, these are the questions. These are the 34 questions that were tied to um, uh, 
answering uh, uh, the questions of whether or not how strong we were in our level of commitment. So when you see for institutional commitment, leadership commitment, all of the six competencies, you can see the individual questions that were asked. And you can also see what, what score uh, each uh, question was asked, the aggregate score of each question. Now notice these questions are color coded, dark blue, light blue, and a very light blue. And what this tells us is what is the rating of the level of commitment? So anything that was rated less than a three, uh, it's very dark blue, uh, low commitment. As you can see here, we don't have any of the dark blues. We, um, the county has uh, scores ranging from 3 to 3.74, moderate commitment, and greater than or equal to 3.75, high commitment. So you see we have high commitment in belonging and inclusion, as well as knowledge and competence uh, within, those, within those areas. And so that, again, just kind of tells us still our, our, um, our greatest opportunities, you can see under data and disparities, is where we have the greatest amount of moderate commitment. Uh, in data and disparities. So data and disparities is not just collecting data, tracking data, but making data transparent. Um, some uh, we may be doing a lot of things behind the scenes in terms of racial equity, but uh, employees may not know or may not see reports, may not see data on 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 this, or it may not be communicated uh, in a way where employees are aware of what all we're doing. Um, so that's one thing to really uh, get some insights from this as well is that we may be doing a lot behind the scenes, but employees just may not be aware of it, and so they're not able to answer uh, the questions effectively. Now. Watch what happens on this next slide. So this next slide is taking the same competency, the same questions, but what we've done is we want to see how much consensus there is by race and ethnicity. So in other words, now we want to see how white employees uh, rated the county or evaluated the county on the six competencies. But we also wanted to see how employees of color evaluated the county on those same competencies and those same questions. Now. Anywhere you see uh, these the questions that are uh, uh, outlined with a green border, this shows you that the race scores were similar. So whites and employees of color uh, rated the county similarly uh, for that particular question. Anywhere you see a red box with a red border, which is only one, uh, this is where the race scores were different and they were statistically significant in their differences. So for this particular one, when we asked the question, regardless of race, all employees have equal opportunity to advance, including good job assignments, promotions, and salary increases, there was some statistically significant differences between what white employees thought and what employees of color thought. Um, and anywhere you see questions that are uh, bordered with a yellow, uh, have a yellow border, this is where the, uh, they're marginal, meaning they're on the borderline from being uh, race scores that are different, okay? Not race scores that are similar, but they're on, the, they're on the borderline, meaning they didn't meet the threshold to actually have a red border, but they were, but they were close. Um, so that's also uh, helpful and it can be and meaningful in terms of insights into so, some, of those, uh, some of those other areas. Now, I want to also show this data in a little bit more of a, a, a graph, a, a chart way, instead of just looking at all of the text. So this is still looking at race, ethnicity, consensus. What you see here is um, you've got the six competencies on the left, and you also have the different uh, uh, the bar chart here in the middle that shows the dark blue bar represents how white employees assessed the county for each of the six competencies. And you can also see how employees of color, the light blue bar right underneath, assess the county for those same six competencies as well. And then you can see the gaps, how large the gaps are and whether or not those gaps are what we call statistically significant gaps, meaning we probably would really want to pay attention to them and see what's driving them. So, excuse me. Um, what you see here is that our strongest competency um, uh, is knowledge and competence commitment. Here we see whites and employees of color uh, pretty much very, very similarly agree in the meaning and the purpose of racial equity. They know what racial inequity looks like. They understand biases, bias in social interactions. And there's very, very little um, uh, disagreement uh, for the questions related to this competency. But the largest statistically significant gap, uh, 0.41, is leadership commitment. Now, the scores overall uh, for whites and employees of color are strong, but the consensus gap 
is one thing that we look for when we do a racial equity audit assessment. We want to see, not that not that we need to have whites and employees of color agree 100% or very, very close, uh, uh, close on all of these different items, but we want to see whether they're not statistically significant differences. That That's one of the keys that we're looking for, as well as strong scores overall for each competency. And, and what probably really uh, weighed this down was that one question, which I showed you on the previous slide, uh, which talked about equitable opportunity and you know advancement, promotions, uh, compensation. The second largest gap was data and disparities. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, was data uh, and disparities. Well, again, where we see um, uh, employees of color assess the county lower in those areas. Now, if you look at all six competencies, you will see that employees of color assess the county um, lower on all six competencies. Even though knowledge and competence commitments, the gaps are a little bit small, but you can see they rate it lower. But only three, um, only four of the six competencies are statistically significant gaps, is what, what we can see there. So what this does is this modifies our overall commitment score uh, from a 3.88 to a 3.61. Now, why is that? Because we're factoring in race and ethnicity consensus. We're not just looking at the aggregate uh, commu uh, community or the aggregate uh, uh, demographics of employees. We want to be able to factor in and see what how people of color also uh, assess the county and be able to give them a voice that actually modifies this this score. Otherwise, it'd be a blind spot. We we ask ourselves, hey, how does everyone you know feel? They feel included. They feel like they belong. Well, if the organization is um, can be largely homogeneous or one particular group, the the score or the results could be skewed. So it's important to break it out and disaggregate it by race ethnicity. And so our year one score is actually 3.61, which again still uh, communicates the amount of work that has really been done over the past few years to build this infrastructure um, that's going to help the county really continue advancing racial equity uh, going forward. But now having a baseline uh, to really assess and track our progress going forward as well. We're going to move down to looking at some of the racial equity best practices and the gap analysis. So this slide really illustrates uh, it, the racial equity best practices. These are evidence-based best practices, and it tells us what the county's current status is for having these best practices in place. Um, as you can see, so I won't read through all of these just to maximize our time, but there are things that we look for, again, that are tied to evidence that we know will move the needle to advance racial equity. And there's a legend here that kind of t indicates what the status is. Either the county has not started this work, it's emerging, it's establishing, or it's reinforcing. Uh, as well. And so um, having something like a dedicated position responsible for racial equity, that's something that is in, that's present, it's active, and we're reinforcing that. Um, but it also shows that there are a lot of things that are either um, a lot of items, best practices that are partially in place or the process for implementation has, has started. Uh, and again, it just shows that the amount of work that still is ongoing for racial equity work, but that the county, as you can see here, has established a lot of best practices um, and, and they're either partially in place and continuing to, to build on those. What are the outcomes and next steps from this audit assessment? Uh, it's going to be to identify uh, countywide each department's racial equity challenges and opportunities. Again, not using opinions, but using data from the audit assessment. Uh, so each department will have a dis have a discussion with the department's equity team, uh, looking at their uh, looking at their uh, department and seeing out what they can do to help the county and contribute to advancing racial equity overall. So tracking our progress and improving our progress, and it's also going to help inform every department uh, about what they're regarding their racial equity action plan and help them develop a scorecard to track their progress. So now we have data um, uh, to be able to help track that and have a baseline that where we can track our progress going forward. And every uh, department can contribute to it uh, using data. Some additional recommendations um, for the county to advance racial equity uh, based on the racial equity group, based on our observations from what the work we've seen the county do as a whole. Uh, when we look at advancing racial equity, we look at four domains. We look at services and programs. So our services and programs 
equitably uh, being delivered to all residents. Uh, and when we look at uh, service and programs, we want to make sure do all residents and stakeholders have equitable access to service and programs? Uh, do they have is there equitable treatment when they act, when they um, uh, obtain those services and programs? And is there equitable quality in the services and the programs they receive from the county? And we know the county has done a resident satisfaction survey in 2021. Um, it may be something to consider uh, to think about were there any significant disparities between demographic groups that were either satisfied or unsatisfied with the services. So within that resident satisfaction survey, we asked, we broke it out by demographic groups, but has the county identified any significant disparities? Because those are inequities when we see significant disparities between demographic groups. That's something to consider regarding the resident satisfaction survey. When it comes to employment, the county has made a tremendous amount of good faith effort year after year with its affirmative action report, something that we think you should definitely keep doing. Uh, one uh, uh, significant change that we would recommend is to disaggregate the category of minorities by race and ethnicity. That is truly a best practice by several federal agencies, including the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, to break it out by demographic group rather than just having all groups and just calling them minorities and then measuring whether or not there's adverse impact uh, or what the disparities are for minorities. Remember, you can have blind spots when you do that. So it's good to break it out, see if there's adverse impact or inequities, and also see who's overrepresented and underrepresented in all different job categories. Uh, so we highly recommend for that to take place. Again, that will only help inform the county to be able to help advance its racial equity work more. Uh, the county has invested a lot in racial equity, so in order to see a return on that investment, those are these are things, recommendations that we think will only help the county uh, advance more in terms of uh, racial equity. Purchasing and procurement. Another domain we look at, the county is already uh, in the process of doing a disparity study uh, as well. That's a best practice. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing the results of that, and, and that's going to uh, really help in purchasing and procurement because employment and purchasing and procurement are two of the greatest inequities that we've seen in our work all across the United States at uh, federal, state, local levels, as well as the private sector. The last domain is representation of board and committee members. Does the county collect and monitor race, ethnicity data on volunteers? Uh, again, uh, if we don't have the data, all we have is an opinion, and we can't determine if there are inequities uh, in the representation of board and committee members. So these four domains, we continue to want to measure, monitor, and manage using data, uh, and this, and, 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 and really measuring this with data is going to help the county uh, get that return on the investment that it's made in racial equity and really help the county ensure that all stakeholders uh, are served equitably. And that will um, conclude our presentation, and I will turn it uh, turn it back over uh, to our county leadership. First, I want to say thank you to Bird and Renee for um, their continued leadership and commitment to supporting us as we advance racial equity in Arlington County. Um, and I also want to send our appreciation to the staff as our team wrapped up the assessment to share baseline metrics um, that will assist us in the next iteration of our work. The county has completed similar climate surveys in the past, but the racial equity assessment that we completed in April and May of 2023 focuses specifically on um, racial equity, and uh, it directly aligns with the assessed component of our strategic framework and goals and serves as a baseline for us to not only see where we're starting from, but uh, then becomes a springboard for goals and outcomes moving forward. At the start of the new year, the racial equity group and I will be meeting with department directors, as Bird said, and their respective racial equity core team members to review their baseline metrics and discuss recommendations for implementation of the action steps. And um, over the last year or so, departments have continued to normalize conversations about race and work diligently to organize uh, their department equity teams that will champion racial equity in their respective work areas. Again, both of those are in alignment with our strategic framework. We are moving toward operationalizing where we'll use this disaggregated data shared in the assessment to identify racial inequities and disparities that can be addressed through our policies, programs, projects, and processes. 
Following these one-on-one -on -one meetings, the Office of Race will provide support and technical assistance to departments as they develop and implement their racial equity action plans, um, many, much of which we'll be sharing more information about when we meet with, meet with those departments in our one-on-ones. And we really look forward to and are very much excited about our continued progress. So I'll turn this back over to our county manager for any closing remarks he may have um, on our commitment to racial equity. Sure. Thank you, Amber and Samia. And you know, as Samia is moving on to our new position at CPHD, uh, I'll be back to you at the beginning of the year. I've talked to each of you about um, what this means for our racial equity efforts. It doesn't mean we're going to be stopping them. We're committed to them. We're coming up on the fifth anniversary of the equity resolution. Talk to each of you about that. There's a lot of data in here. We made a lot of progress. Uh, we have a long way to go. So back to you, Mr. Chair, if you have any questions. Thank you. I'm sure we have a couple of questions or comments. Vice Chair Garvey. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two questions, one general. I assume we'll do this again. How often should we do this survey? And I'm so, I wish we'd done it five years ago. <laughs> you know, I know where we'd gotten. I can, I can refer to Bird on this about um, best practices for how often we should, we should conduct a survey like this. Um, so Bird, if you could respond here. Yes, I can respond. Um, that's a great question. I, I would say that, okay, sorry about that. Um, yes, so typically we say within 12 to 18 months, um, it gives the own organization time to be able to, okay, we've got the results. Now we can start to put in some practices and be able to measure our results. Um, so I would say with the county, uh, I would say every 12 to 18 months would be a good, a good rule of thumb for tracking that progress, be just because you already have a solid foundation. Thank you. I think that's helpful. Yeah, I, I would think maybe a little more like 18 months because just knowing how slow institutions and groups work. So that's great. And then one other, um, I should know the answer to this question. Does the county board office have an equity action plan? The county board office can have an, a racial equity action plan, so we have a meeting scheduled with the board office as well, um, either in January or February, to talk through that. Excellent. And we'll be sharing, um, our office has created a template to support with the development of that plan. Well, I'll need to talk with my colleagues, but I really think I'd like this to have one for, for next year. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Lento. Thank you, Chair Dorsey. Um, I had a clarifying question. Uh, the Hispanic and Latino community I saw was broken down, but when we started to, and maybe this is for Bur Mr. Bird, um, when you start to break down between people of color and white employees, where is the Hispanic Latino community in that category? Well, it's not exactly. I'll defer to Bird on that. Yes. You're available. Yes. That's, that's another great question as well. So we looked at um, we look at people of color, but if you look in the full uh, report, we actually will break it out by demographic groups. So you'll see white, black, Hispanic, uh, Native, whatever, Native American, Asian as well. That it, that as long as the population is enough, where we don't compromise confidentiality mm -hmm. or anonymity. So some, uh, if the organization had a very small amount of people of color, uh, a small amount of black or Hispanics, we would combine them into a people of color. Category category to, in order so people can't be singled out in a sense. But with the county, you'll see it broken out by demographic group uh, as well. And you'll be able to see uh, see that data for each of the questions. You'll see how, how Hispanic, how Asians, Native Americans, how they all assess the county for all those different areas as well. Okay. This was just a highlight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So in the data that you presented today when you were referencing um, the uh, white people. staff members mm -hmm. versus the people of color staff members in the data um, results were the white were the Hispanic and Latino community coupled in with the white staff workers or were they coupled in with the people of color staff workers yes we there we, we uh, Hispanics are with the people of color okay uh, thank, thank you because I know that's been yes. something that every um, different agency have done differently because of how the census has now changed uh, the Hispanic community to an, an ethnic group versus a race so that's very helpful as we analyze this thank you so much Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karen Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that was really insightful, I have to honestly say. I was, um, uh, we, we left it in April when we had our you know, general assessment and we were actually talking about the same things and we, but it's now um, 
I have to say it's not it's not surprising, but I'm not overly thrilled to see that race makes a very big difference in how we self-assess. <laughs> so, and it's so consistent and, and blatant and, and in our face. I mean, this is really, really a, a takeaway for me that is critical. And I see also that um, there's another uh, bold takeaway that uh, what we have in general knowledge, it doesn't seem to penetrate in the other <laughs> Uh, uh, instances and the criteria, especially in the leadership. So um, when you are, the, 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 my question here is, uh, when you're going back to departments, you know how, you know, you know the, the map now. Uh, how are you going to tackle the leadership versus the general awareness and the other criteria? Uh, because I, I believe that these are two different levels of interventions here. There's also two different types of employees, frankly. Absolutely. And probably also racially very different types of employees, because one thing that they haven't seen there, and maybe our uh, report, rapporteur here can help us, out of these, what is the, the, actual, the actual make of you know, demographics of our leadership personnel? To, for you know, uh, compared to our general person. So I'll start with the first part of that question. I think what will be helpful in moving the needle in some of those other areas that we've um, looked at for some of those other indicators is really um, where we are now is the, the operationalizing piece, right? So we're, we continue to normalize. We continue to have conversations about race. Um, departments have organized their department equity teams, and so they've got a group of folks who are championing this work, um, ideally in, in their department. And so now we're moving to a phase where we have this baseline data, and we're able to share that with them um, in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. and get them to a place where they're starting to develop those racial equity action plans. And in those plans, we can use some of these baseline metrics to start to develop um, actions and outcomes, goals and outcomes to move us, move the needle in some of those areas where we have opportunity to do that. And so I think um, really speaking intentionally and honestly about where we have opportunities um, and for each department that may look different, but really having those conversations on the front end and supporting them, um, our office supporting them with how they develop those plans to be able to address some of those things. Um, and so that's where I think I'll, if you have anything to add there, um, Samia, um, but that is my initial thought is how we cultivate the conversation around the way that departments are building those plans um, and making sure that those things are tangible, they're, they're, um, they are able to be achieved, right? These are not, we're not shooting for the stars, but we really want to make sure that these are things that we're able to do um, and things that we're able to achieve as they're building those plans out. I'll also just add that the structure for those meetings, having the department director, i.e. representing leadership with the department equity team, which is not typically leadership, will help to also, I think, bridge that gap in understanding what the competencies are, what the data is showing, and then be able to, as Ms. Barnett said, translate that into the action plans when we understand where each department is in terms of their leadership and then what the staff has identified as areas of um, difference, if you will, through the data to make that connection there in those meetings, I think will be really important. And I think Bert could probably speak to um, the demographic breakdown for the leadership within the uh, survey results if he has that information. Uh, the, demo, the demographic breakdown. Now, was was the was the question wanting to know what is the demographics of just the leadership of the county, or just the demographics of leadership for people who took the survey? Just want to make sure I was clear on the question. Um, well, in that case, because most of the data is about the people who took a valid survey, so let's keep it consistent with that and answer the question about the demographics of those who actually. Uh, responded meaningfully this survey oh okay yes um, so when you there is there is going to be a slide uh, within in that but I, I can share some of that with you now where you will see it broken out by what are the demographics of the respondents who were staff and then what were the demographics of the respondents who were um, managers uh, uh, managers and supervisors now I could 
if you would like to, I can. Um, I don't know if I can share that, or I can just give you the give you the, the percentages. Just a number if they have them handy, and if you don't, it's okay. We we will sure. see the full report, and we will be able to read that, and the public will be able to read this as well. Yep. So. So of the 375 who said they were a manager, 20% were women of color, uh, about 25% were white women, and 20% were white men, 14% were men of color, and we had 10.7% 10, 10 were unknown um, mm -hmm. race and gender. Uh, and then below, uh, and then we had two, three, three percent that were also uh, unknown. So we had a lot of unknown um, race as well as unknown race and gender. Yeah, uh, I understand that. Thank yeah. you. That's very. That makes it even more intriguing. And and I have to say, uh, one of the my takeaways from your amazing work until now was the uh, effectiveness and the brilliance of having departmental uh, race equity teams. And I was really ex expecting that these would help, you know, to kind of homogenize these results. But here it is. It is far tougher than we anticipated, apparently. So thank you for, for providing this insight tonight. Thank you. Uh, do you have another thing, Ms. Talento? Just Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to, um, I forgot to mention, I was also focused on the data. Thank you for this work and this really wonderful report. I think that this type of data and information is how we do improve and get to the excellence that we seek. But I want to make sure that we know we've done some amazing work here. And thank you for your leadership in that. And thank you, Bird, for bringing this information um, to us. Thank you. Thanks. Question for you, Mr. Guess, if you're still with us. Um, can you talk a little bit more about one of the uh, best practices uh, for uh, communities to have some sort of a, a target goal as it relates to um, race and equity goals within departments that's tied to either employment bonuses or salary. Can you speak a little bit more as to uh, why that's a recommended best practice? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, so one of the things that's really critical, uh, and, and, and it's also just for leadership as well, you know, you all, I'm sure you all have heard the phrase, what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. We like to say what gets measured and monitored uh, keeps getting done. And so when you look at the research, um, and we look at research from Frank Dobbin uh, from Harvard University, Don Thomas Gobert Deeb from University of Massachusetts, who've been tracking uh, public and private sector organizations since the 60s on how they've been able to change and advance racial equity, uh, out of a suite of best practices, one of them is making sure that leadership performance uh, is tied to, uh, in, the, in the private sector, you, you have, you know, bonuses and, 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 and things like that. In the, private, in, the, in the public sector, you know, you may not have actual, you know, bonuses being uh, given out to, you know, depending on some municipalities. I know some can be for some municipalities, depending on their policies. But, um, but, but just making performance appraisals and evaluations, having those include uh, racial equity is important and critical. And the reason why is um, people will focus on and, and people will tend to separate racial equity work from, quote unquote, their real work. My real work is what I get evaluated on from my boss. If I have time to do the racial equity things, I'll have some time. But if not, I'm going to focus on what my real work is, what I get evaluated on and what what I think my boss is looking at. And a lot of times we, the biggest challenge we see is when people separate those racial equity goes on the shelf and it becomes very stagnant. But if I'm but if I'm measured on it, it's in that appraisal or my bonus or uh, compensation is tied to it, then it, it's something that that I have to do. It's part of my performance. It's just how I do business as in my business unit. Thank you for that <clears throat> detail. The you know in initially I see the pay thing and I think well that can be gamed pretty easily. But your further detail I think not only gives us a roadmap for the public sector, but also I think reveals really the true meaningful part is integrating these goals or expectations within you know one's core employment uh, you know relationships, whether they be annual work plans, job descriptions, or the like. That's really the way to get at what at least I heard you saying. Yep, and I'll say one more uh, comment to that as well. As you're right, the, the system can, it can still kind of be gamed somewhat depending on what goals are set. So you use the data to set the goals because otherwise I could set very unmeaningful goals <laughs> yes. uh, uh, as well. So making sure that and having, a, having a, a equity officer or an equity team to set aspirational goals based on data. 
Well, thank you. I'm sorry we don't have a chance to get more fully into the cross tabs and everything here, but I do appreciate your presenting this work. And, you know, hopefully as we go about uh, integrating this with the discussions with departments, we don't default to what many people do when they are audited or scored, and that is focus on why they didn't get the maximum and instead look at it, as Ms. Talento said, as an opportunity to understand where you are so that you can actually uh, have some, not only aspirational, but achievable goals moving forward. So thank you again.